Hi everyone, this is Grace Buffering Time and we shall be live within a minute. Two rather. We shall give you all time to join in on our Facebook and YouTube. Welcome Ranjana, welcome Kirti. Please tag your friends in the comments so that more and more people can join us. It's great to see all of you joining in. A very big namaste and welcome everyone to our well-being series with me, Roshni Shanaz. And we are here today on our Soulful Saturdays with a very, very amazing personality today. So this person is though an inspirational soul in my life, it is only very recent that I have come to know of him in person. He is someone who is a completely unconventional medical personality. Please help me in sharing your love, comments, and your blessings for this wonderful episode with Dr. Keki Turel. He is an internationally eminent neurosurgeon, Professor Emeritus, Department of Neurosurgery, Bombay Hospital, Institute of Medical Sciences, and above all, a multi-talented personality. Besides his innumerable medical feats, people, he is, uh, you know, not just a pioneer in uh, microsurgery in India from 1979, He's also one of the first surgeons who operated on an AIDS patient in 1989. And he is also a cricketer, a professional photographer, who is now preparing a coffee table book on wildlife. The role order can go on and on. So without much ado, let me welcome Dr. Keki Turel to begin our Soulful Saturday. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us today. One second. I'll just, yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, Roshni, very much for giving me this honor and this rare opportunity to be with uh, your uh, followers. I am oh. going to follow you and follow them. <laughs> no, we are, we are today here to follow your uh, Saj advice and your insights on life and uh, everything about life. So uh, getting straight into it, because Dr. Turel has tons of things to share with us, I don't want to leave a moment passing by. So diving into this session, I would like to break a myth with uh, Dr. Turel. You know, a lot of parents from olden times to now as well, with tedious professions or studies like uh, medicine, law, or engineering, and so many like that, Parents often push their kids 
only to be you know engrossed and focused in studies and kids have no time children have no time to focus on their passions or hobbies but i can see that you have a plethora of hobbies that you've nurtured and cultivated in your life so how was it to be a young doctor and hon all those hobbies as well i think the first of all the parents have to become like children they should see the innocence uh, in their lives see how uh, how curious they are the children are having the most curious mind and that is why they are able to uh, learn so much during their young days you as you grow older you tend to learn less and less because you are experiencing less and less and you are less and less curious i think uh, curiosity is the biggest virtue innocence is the other part of childhood and uh, those who tend to uh, uh, su suppress them suppress their idea suppress their wishes i think we are doing something very wrong to our children let them grow let them be free and let them experience the uh, the goodness of nature and the goodness of this planet and i am sure they will find their own way our job is not to compel them our job is only to guide them one by our own uh, by our own example by by our own behavior and by our own manners and so on setting them an example and the other thing is stopping them from doing something wrong holding their hand when they are in trouble but always allowing them the full freedom to express themselves that is the way my parents allowed us i think my father was too busy making two ends meet we were uh, five of us over 11 years my father was a uh, devout uh, religious devoutly religious person he would go to the uh, fire temple or three fire temples every day after work before coming home and um, so religion was very deeply steeped into our uh, into our system right from our young days and we were all very prayerful we belonged to a dastur family so naturally religion was very natural prayers were very natural spirituality came natural to us and um, we are all in our family we are all dastus so if people understand what uh, uh, parsis go through they go through the ceremony of navar and martab to become a dastur that's what i have also done as a as a young yes. uh, pre pubertal kid you are supposed to do that at that time right and uh, i became a dastur also so that was one of the uh -huh. early things and i conducted religious ceremonies i even conducted navjots of my nieces wow so the yeah so we are a very large family and we all uh, live together in fact that was the golden dream of my father that uh, all children he has four sons and one daughter uh, the daughter of course is married and staying away but the four sons are all living together with their grandchildren so in one uh -huh. building under one roof well not one roof but maybe 16 rooms <laughs> <laughs> I can see that you have an amazing sense of humor as well as an added uh, you know feather in your humor. cap. <laughs> humor is very important I must tell everybody. True. You work hard, play hard, smile a lot, laugh a lot because that's the best way to let out your negativities also. And uh, you must laugh at everything. Laughter is the greatest medicine as you must have heard is very often said but it should be practiced. And there was a friend of mine who used to uh, have a joke book next to his bedside. So the moment he would wake up in the morning, he would read five jokes, laugh to his gut, to his end, to his guts end, and then start the day. And wow. you know about the laughter clubs, which go around at Five yes. Gardens, very close to my house. Yes. So uh, I know that laughter is a very good thing. Yes. True. True. It's so. It's so that's so, how we started our lives uh, with with my with my parents. We we were brought up in with very humble beginnings. We stayed in. Pandey Sanatorium, which is now, of course, dilapidated. It's not really existing now, but it was a uh, great place for us. We all we bonded very well with our co-tenants. We just had a small little. My parents just had a small little kitchen to live in, and all of us were sleeping on the open veranda or whatever you call it, and we lived in a chow. And I I can tell you, we were those were the happiest days of my life. Living out in the open, being in with nature, going to Kaf Parade and having a bath in the sea. There was no none of those uh, um, uh, those buildings which are there now. Nothing of that sort. It was wide open sea. So we grew up with uh, very natural surroundings. And those days, Mumbai was extremely less crowded. Uh, there were hardly any vehicles. So uh, and the only 
only car that came to our school was the car of uh, uh, Ashok Kumar, who was a film actor. His son was one of my classmates. So we had a very natural life. We, quite often we would walk down from Kolaba to Gobitalao, um, uh, not waiting for a bus or a tram. So we had very, very natural and free upbringing. Our parents, in fact, as I told you, never really pushed us into doing something. Right. We just grew. Right. We allowed ourselves to grow. He allowed us to explore everything. We joined scouting. We joined everything possible that was there. And we did everything with great fun. Life was, uh, life was just beautiful, I can tell you that. True, and it is. And there is there is so much of, uh, you know, I guess all of this beautiful upbringing that you spoke about uh, is uh, the fragrance of humility that you, uh, you know, spread today. And just speaking and listening to you with the, you know, that awe of simplicity and uh, the awe and rawness of the life that you have led is so beautiful to just like, you know, take in. That's really, really, uh, you know, uh, we all decide when we are young, I want to be a pilot and I want to be this and I want to be that. I want you to tell us of the bizarre story of how you decided to become a doctor, which is very, very unlike any youngster deciding to take up his career. Okay, let me just uh, add one more point of the Pandya Sanatorium where we lived. Sure. That's the place where where I where I became a vegetarian at the age of six and a half. We used to wow. crowd around a certain, a certain lame lady who would give us all kinds of stories of uh, of uh, the Indian Indian saints and uh, how it was not good to kill and destroy life. And I was always, from the very beginning, uh, very uh, friendly with animals, very fond of life, nature, mm -hmm. as I told you. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, right. overnight, when I heard this lady, I became a vegetarian. I just went to my mother and told her, I'm, from today, I'm not going to eat anything non-vegetarian. No mother, no fish, no eggs, nothing. Wow. My, mother, my mother said, Baba, we are in a Parsi family. How can you do this? <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, never mind. We will do it. My mother was very supportive. Uh, she even told me that when I was born, there was a butcher's strike. So it was just natural that I would become a vegetarian. Wow. So at the age of six and a half, I willed myself to be a vegetarian, which I am till today. Commendable. And this, yes. And irrespective of where I went in Europe or wherever, where language was a problem, where I could not express myself, I had to starve so many times, but it didn't matter to me. I remain a vegetarian and I'm very proud of it. And I think that I can tell you that is the reason of my very good touch wood, very good health. Great. I'll tell you many more, uh, many more secrets of good health later on. Absolutely. But this, is one of, but this is one of them. Absolutely. So, so you asked me a question as to how I became a doctor. And he was uh, into single sewing machine company. So he was repairing machines and I, and with my brothers, we were all automatically assembling machines, repairing machines. We had that kind of a craft of, of, of uh, engineering. So in my school report book, every year I would say, oh, what, am, what am I going to become? An engineer. Then came SSC. We had 11 standard doses, not 10 plus 2. After matriculation, every summer vacation, we used to go to our parents' home in Surat. So every vacation, we used to go to Surat. And this was after 11 Senate, we had a very long vacation of two and a half months or so. And I stumbled upon a book of palmistry by Kiro. Mm -hmm. Book on palmistry, book on numerology, and mm -hmm. something else. So I read all those uh, books. There was nothing else to do there. So I just sat and read, and I read the book of numerology and palmistry, and I read my palm in great, with great intensity. And I realized that engineering is not my field. Not my future. Wow. And maybe I can use engineering in my in my life, and uh, then I can use. Uh, but medicine was my future, and wow. I could believe that because I was already very kind to animals, and I was already having a sympathy towards life. I was already a vegetarian from that point of view, so I thought, yes, why not become a doctor, help people? I was very, I was always very helpful, running around, kind to people. So this became very natural to list, to to help to help people. And uh, vegetarianism helped me to, uh, uh, to exploit this uh, field further. And uh, engineering, our engineering skills, I saw also helped me to become a surgeon. 
So wow. this was just natural for me. So I became a doctor and I already decided that I'm going to be a surgeon. Wow. That I became a neurosurgeon was a different story. I still didn't know when I went into a medical school that I would be a neurosurgeon. But uh, the brain fascinated me from the very beginning. Mm. And we had a wonderful uh, neurologist, physician called Dr. Vadia, who nurtured us through medicine and through neurology. And I got deeply attracted to neurology. And since I was also deeply attracted to neurosurgery, I said, uh, to, to surgery, I said the only way to become a neurosurgeon was to have a wedding of the two, neurology and surgery. So I wedded awesome. the two together and became a neurosurgeon. So simple. Wow. Wow. You put it so simply. <laughs> you put it so simply. Over here, uh, you know, uh, people uh, grapple with life, what clothes to wear on a day. And you've just put it so beautifully in a very matter of fact manner of you deciding not just to take medicine out of the blue, but to become a neurologist and then a neurosurgeon to top it. So I think it is, uh, it is so beautiful when the calling of our lives comes so early to us. Uh, you know, it's such a blessing, uh, truly. My and father asked me, my father asked me, why do you want to be a neurosurgeon? What is neurosurgeon? First of all, he didn't know it. Mm -hmm. I said, neurosurgery means operating on the brain and operating on the spinal cord and nerves. Is it possible to operate on the brain? Can anybody survive after brain surgery? <laughs> wow. So these was very simple questions. I said, I don't know. Let me find out. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I will go to my neurosurgery department and I will ask my teacher over there. And I'm sure. And my teacher also was not too encouraging. He was very fine. He was very welcoming. But he said, mm. don't expect any miracles. We right. have almost 100% people dying after brain surgery. Uh, so are uh, you still sure you want to become a brain surgeon? I said, yes. In that case, I would like to be because I would like to make a difference from the 100%. We will come to something like zero percent sooner or later. I was Beautiful. so sure about it. Beautiful. And I was so sure because optimism runs in my blood. Blood group O. That's my blood group. <laughs> Brilliant. O my, 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 my blood group is the same. Yeah, so we are both amazing. <laughs> so I'm sure. I, I love this connection now, uh, more so ever, <laughs> that it runs in the blood. Absolutely, yes. And you, to talk about it that, uh, you know, I think all the medical feats that you've achieved somewhere answered your father's question, I think, because you have pioneered to, uh, you know, begin the microsurgery of the brain. You are someone who has dealt with surgeries of one of the biggest tumors. So uh, to well, share us a little true. bit, uh, you know, uh, kind of little top dot anecdotes on uh, these very intimidating things just thinking about something like that you know makes us feel oh my god how would it be for you to you know uh, be in that situation so when, so when we trained as uh, neurosurgeons we did not have uh, we did not have a microscope we were just operating with our bare naked eyes and uh, there were many things which could not be seen visualized in detail the anatomy and all that mind you i'm talking about the pre-ct scan era when we were oh. trained, there was no CT scans. Right. We used to do angiogram by puncturing neck with a needle, injecting the eye, seeing the circulation in the brain. And from those tons of circulation, we would say, ah, that's where the disease is, or that's where the tumor wow. is, or that's where we will open and see. So we will open and see. Today, scans can tell you everything. But those days, we had to uh, just guess, uh, have our knowledge of anatomy, have our knowledge of... Uh, angiography and used to inject air sometimes in the brain to know the circ to know the, the air shadows and how they were displaced in order to identify the masses in the brain and that's all so then we realized that surgery had to improve and uh, then along the international scene came this idea of using the microscope the ENT surgeons were already using it the neurosurgeons acquired this idea from the ENT and from my seniors in the West, we had nobody in India doing microsurgery before me, mind you. But we had some foreigners, some German people who came over to India and they talked about it. They demonstrated a few things. We had a couple of workshops in the 70s, late 70s. Wow. And I said, oh, this is brilliant. You can see by magnification, by using a microscope, you have a huge amount of magnification. You have brilliant light, you have brilliant focus. You can unzoom and zoom and you can see the beauty of nature, unraveling, 
under a microscope. So when you're operating with a microscope, it's like deep sea diving. You see all beautiful colors, creatures, structures. It is so yeah. romantic. It's so lovely to see those beautiful things. Even disease looks beautiful under a microscope. Wow. Wow. So it is, is... It, is, it, is, it is a matter of not only science, but also art. So it is an art and science combination. Neurosurgery is a combination of science and art. And uh, then, of course, you need to have very fine and delicate instruments. You need to be able to go into the depth of the surgeries with those micro millimeter instruments, one millimeter, 0.5 millimeter, 0.25 millimeter tips. Technology also improved. Scanning came along. Our microscopes improved. So everything went on building and building very rapidly. Once the ice was broken, we had almost, uh, you know, sky's the limit for that. And we still have a long way to go. We have got computers, we have got navigation, we have got endoscopy, we have got all kinds of things coming along. And I'm, I would say, I would shudder to think what surgery would be after five years. I cannot tell you. It will be so mind boggling. You already have robotics. You already have a yes. surgeon sitting in Italy operating on somebody in America yes. or vice yes. versa. Yes. So you see, all these kinds of things are happening and it is not some, uh, um, some imagination. It's a true story. So we have to catch up. Now the problem is, as you grow older, you have to keep pace with new developments. Today, right. it doesn't matter if I have to see my young fellow growing up and becoming, uh, using uh, gadgets, which I may be struggling to use, but I have to learn. I have to upgrade, I have to update myself because I'm the teacher. I am the guru and teachers and students will take inspiration from me. So I have to measure up to their expectation. True. So I have to keep on advancing beautiful. and keep beautiful. on growing. And the journey is so beautiful. It is unending. And I don't think I will ever stop operating or ever stop learning till the last day of my life, as long as my brain and hands function, of course. Awesome. Awesome. And Blessings. for that, you need to keep it working. You need to keep it working. And you need to involve many such shaktis in your system. You need to involve yoga, meditation, prayer, all those things are going to be a part of your uh, learning and part of your growth. And this is uh, not going to stop. Beautiful. I don't beautiful. know, am I speaking too much? Not at all. It's amazing. And you know, the, this beautiful connection that you, you know, one always uh, feels and believes in every cell that the creator is the most magnificent artist. And yes. you just put it so beautifully that uh, surgery and artistry are such hand in glove with each other that you can marvel actually with this magnificent creation inside uh, the human brain and everything that it is rather than when we think about it and you know just I, I uh, you know you see how in movies or in documentaries when students are uh, dissecting a frog when they are learning medicine how they shudder at times so to just think how beautifully you put about uh, the human brain surgery being an artistic aspect of life for you it, it, it just fascinates me to even think about it and i would love to be in an ot with you once to yes. just see this marvel uh, <laughs> unfold in front of you, my you, eyes you would be surprised actually i call surgery as a form of meditation every wow. operation is meditation and if you cannot, if you cannot, if you cannot be a good surgeon, if you cannot be meditating. So surgery Beautiful. itself is an exercise in meditation. Beautiful. And so how can you be tired? Meditation is actually alertness. Absolutely. Wakeful awareness. So you, you are in fact enjoying it. You are enjoying the beauty of nature. You are enjoying the tranquility and the peace of your mind. So True. sometimes, and I'm notorious for operating on very, very long operations, very long hmm. hours. Hmm. In fact, some of my operations have been the longest in uh, recorded in the world, 27 wow. hours, 26 hours, nonstop, without oh. getting up from my, from my, without leaving my operating room. Oh my God. Nonstop. Well, wow. I don't know if I can wow. do that today, but I had that josh in me during those younger days. And I could hmm. do that 26, 27 hours operations uh, on three occasions. But Amazing. 18 hours, 20 hours is quite common. But today it will not take so much time because our experience has grown so that the same operation will be done in much faster time. So I've had this uh, rare experience. And also, as you mentioned, I had the rare fortune 
of seeing the world's largest brain tumors coming straight to me. Uh, this was a young Arab boy who was only 18 years old and he was uh, handicapped. He became handicapped because of the brain tumor. He lost his vision. He lost his control on his senses. He uh, lost his movement of his limbs and was brought in a blinded condition from uh, Middle East. And he was brought over here. Those days we had no scans also. We did an angiogram and I said, oh, wow, this is supposed to be such a huge tumor. Wow. I've never seen such a sweep of the arteries. And I told my school friend, Homi Daruwala, he was a wonderful uh, stage actor. And uh, uh, at that time, he was the leading yeah. uh, a PowerPoint presenting person. He was uh, mm -hmm. one of the leaders in our country. In fact, the government of Singapore had invited him to make a PowerPoint presentation for tourism of Singapore. So mm -hmm. he was my class friend, but he was extremely nervous, nervous boy. He said, how will I be able to see this blood? I said, you will uh, manage everything. You just bring your cameras at you. And there we are. In a, and where did we do this? In Masina Hospital. A very average oh. hospital at that time. Yes. And I had magnifying glasses. I used loops. I did not have a microscope. And we removed this tumor. I anticipated this would be the world's largest tumor. Just It was just a wild guess. So when we were operating... The old type 16 mm movies, you know, you heard of that Hollywood yeah. movies. Yes. So the movie yes. was made that way, and I removed the tumor all in one piece. It was as big as the size of my hand. You can see the size of my hand. My God. The wow. largest the hand. My hand is a is a is a my glove size is eight and a half, which is the largest the glove companies manufacture. Whoa. So I have huge hands, but they are very delicate. <laughs> Uh, but so, you know yeah. something that you mentioned is so very important because we have so many misconceptions about meditation and uh, the other day we were sharing as well that meditation is all about mindfulness of this moment of now and anything yes. that we do with passion and integration of our mind body and spirit is yes. meditation if you are reading and you are completely like you know uh they're uh, pe uh, permeated into the lives of the characters, then you're meditating. If you're cooking with all your love and not bothered about the TV going on or the kids jumping around, then you're meditating. So, so beautifully Absolutely. you put it uh, that the your sound, every surgery. The sound. Yes, the sounds can come and the sounds can go. Is meditation is, uh, you know, it is, it is actually not concentration. People think it is concentration. True. It, is, it is restfulness. You are, at, you are at your relaxed best when you are meditating. Absolutely. And that's what is you are when you are operating also. Or I'm saying not, but operation of course has its own tense moments. There are some very uh, difficult times and difficult moments. And uh, I can tell you it is not fun. Uh, when the Absolutely. arteries start bleeding and some of them, Whoa. the blood can go and hit the ceiling. <laughs> and you, have to, and you have to control all that blood loss. You need to have calm, nerves of calm and you can do that. And doing something repeatedly gets you better and better. I'm not saying that we are perfect from the day one, but well, you get better. You learn from each time. You learn from your mistakes. True. You learn from the mistakes of others. True. And you should be attentive. If you are attentive, you will never make the same mistake again. True. So, so let me ask you. Mention, very important. Yes. Let me ask you, you know, you're one of the very few medical uh, professionals I know with this large spiritual bent. And I know from now what you've shared with us that it is primarily contributed through your upbringing, through the spiritual connection that your parents, you know, shared with you and uh, so on. You know, in life, uh, sir, we have created separation for everything. And so do we do in spirituality and science as well. But there are some beautiful souls like you who have blended the two biggest siblings and strengths. And I feel uh, in these last 10 years of my little journey, uh, you know, which is a speck dot in your uh, vast uh, life and journey, that uh, if these two strengths, science, medicine, energy, and spirituality meet, we can do some incredible wonders for the enhancement of humanity. Because this entire thing that each is the competition to the other or condescending uh, one for the other, I do not feel. I feel they are complementing aspects and siblings who have just been estranged by our foolish, uh, egoistic and non-aware, you know, ignorant minds. And if people like you can come to the forefront to bring them back and, you know, 
tell the world that this is what we can do when this magic joins hands, I think would be great. So please share some light on that. See, uh, science and spirituality are no different. They are just two sides of the same coin. We sometimes say husband and wife are two sides of the same coin, but they are the opposite sides. I'm sure there are some happy marriages too. Some, so science and spirituality are two sides of one coin. And both of them, the aim of science and spirituality are not any different. They both are aiming to reach the same goal. Science is seeking for answers in spirituality and spirituality is seeking for answers in science. And I don't think that they consider, ultimately, you have to understand that physical scientists who have, who have uh, understood science in their field, they are no different from the, from the special uh, uh, scientists who spend their time engaging in spiritual activity. So make no mistake, doctors and scientists are not any less spiritual than Absolutely. the so-called spiritual people. True. And the True. spiritual people are also deeply steeped into science to unravel the mysteries of science. For example, True. the evolution. For example, belief in God or nature or whatever you call True. it. So are these uh, questions not to be answered by just some spiritual guru or just by, by, by some atomic scientist? I think we have to work together to find solutions. And for us, the aim is still the same. The same Absolutely. aim for the spiritual person. The journey is the same. For True. scientists as well as for the spiritual. And a scientist who combines spirituality and the spiritual person who combines science, they will be more successful and they will do much better for this world than just pursuing one passion uh, by itself. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I completely agree with you and uh, have uh, you know tried my level best uh, to do that in these last uh, 12 years of my little journey and in fact uh, right from the beginning i uh, you know uh, felt uh, and was guided never to use this term alternative medicine because nothing can actually alternate something we are only complementing terms and complementing streams towards that one vision as you just said so uh, you know it is so important i feel for all of us to come together to have this brilliant understanding that you shared that we all have the same vision and that is the highest goodness for humanity enhancement and growth of humanity and if we all can work together towards that one vision i think we can create an amazing world around us and for us i truly feel thank you so much sir for uh, you know uh, this aspect you see i must tell that everybody must believe in the law of nature Everybody must believe in respecting nature. And today, this what is, there is there's a buzz in the air because of this virus that has come up. And that is because we have abused nature over the centuries, over the decades. And this is what we are seeing today. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, our lack of respect for nature is uh, what leads to diseases. And again, the role of the spiritual person and the role of the scientist is to understand nature to understand the laws of nature and to understand that, that there is a big power that created everything. And then you try to yes. discover the truth. You discover the hidden secrets of that power by whatever methods, by your spirituality as well as by your science. And you have to combine right. the two. Beautiful. Both will, you know, both sit in silence. As I said, when I'm operating, I'm meditating. Both sit in silence, waiting and watching. Whether you are looking at the sky and looking through the telescope, through the telescope as a scientist does at the stars, or whether you are looking at the at the at the brilliant uh, stars that are arising, uh, sparks that are arising in your own heart and your own mind. You see, so you have to learn from your within, and you have to learn from the outside nature at the you same time. Good. Beautiful, sir. Such a beautiful thing that you learn from within and the without and combine the two strengthful aspects to enhance your life. And that will be the true understanding and paving the path for the future for people who combine and understand the laws of nature and put it together as a hand in glove strength. Thank you so much. You know, all of this... Uh, it's just so amazing and more amazing, sir, uh, let me tell you, because even though, uh, as you said, that yes, medical people are not less spiritual 
or anything you hear less of the, the you know these kind of things from the uh, the pragmatic lot of uh, people that are uh, there in the field and there could be varied reasons for that but uh, not going in there i would come to a very very important spiritual experience of your life which uh, at least i don't know of uh, you know any medical person having uh, this kind of a spiritual bent and understanding that you do so uh, within that aspect i would love to ask you that you know i was truly astounded to hear about your nde experience the near death experience that you shared and i would love you to share uh, those uh, you know those absolutely uh, I, i don't those very surreal moments uh, of uh, seeing and feeling your soul away from your body and then coming back to life please share yes, with it, us sir in fact this was a, uh, a life turning kind of, kind of an event in my life um some years ago i think it was 1988 or 87 i, I can't remember but uh, 87 or 88 and i was called uh, by the way i had started neurosurgery in oman i was the first one to pioneer neurosurgery in that country sultanate wow. of oman wow. as i did in some other countries also i was a, i played the foundation stone of neurosurgery in that country so i was uh, already known to people there and there was a road accident in which a couple and their two kids were uh, uh, were were involved in an accident and the wife had a very bad uh, injury to the neck the car dashed into another vehicle and she got an uprooting effect of the neck what we call as a hangman fracture and she was completely paralyzed and helpless and she was almost declared dead when she was brought to the hospital in muscat this happened because of an unusual rainfall which they had not experienced before now she was taken to the nearest military hospital from there the military doctor is do nothing about it they just give some initial resuscitation revived her and eventually asked me to uh, uh, they called me from mumbai and i flew down to treat her and as the story goes i managed to operate on her i fixed her spine with whatever available instruments plates and screws were there i fixed her hanger and structure and lo and behold it was successful and the lady gradually from the death condition practically death condition became alive and she's still alive till today i i know her and she moves around freely independently she recovered fully now a week later after that accident i was called again to oman to assess her reassess At that time i was so overworked because everywhere the buzz went around that this magnificent operation has been done and this is a, a great story so i had four non stop day and night of work every day from morning till night i was working all night i was partying and there was very little sleep on the last day i was uh, asked to go to the military hospital to give that lecture on spine injury which was that's what i treated so i went to across at about lunch time i gave a, a nice lecture to the to the very beautiful auditorium of the hospital and that was my last evening in muscat and i was to return by the uh, late evening or early morning no late night flight um and i was driving the bmw which the patient had given me i had already a driving license as i told you that i used to frequently go there so i had a driving license i was driving and i like to drive i'm a very fast driver i love cars i drive very fast crazy i'm uh, very crazy when i'm driving but i'm very slow and careful when i'm operating <laughs> in a two opposites so here you are i was overworked i was tired but i wanted to reach my hotel so i was driving at a and the more i felt sleepy the faster i tried to go and uh, eventually i fell off to sleep on the wheel and my car mind which is the right hand drive over there in oman that means left hand drive on the right side of the road and from the third lane the fast lane which is inside i went to the second and to the first and if i had continued that we would have gone into the valley and gone to my and seen my death but quite reflexly i turned the car and very rapidly and swerved it and it came and hit the midline divider which was about at least more than a foot tall and the car hit over there it tumbled it tumbled tumbled and then dragged along the road and once this happened 
I had lost all consciousness. For those few moments, I was disconnected from this world. I saw the entire video of my life, my entire past. It came like an extremely fast rewind. Right from my childhood to the time I actually came to this place, became a neurosurgeon. I'm saying goodbye to my family, to my parents, to everybody. I'm saying, I'm sorry to leave you like this. I'm going. And suddenly I go up. I, feel, I see myself ascending the skies. I get into some kind of a whiteness. And then there is an old man with a white beard, with a white dress, puts his hands on my head and tells me, no child, this is not the time for you. You still have a lot of work to do. So go back and continue your journey. And my eyes opened. By that time, so you can imagine how much time it takes for the car to tumble and tumble and tumble and come and stop. So it was all this that happened in those few moments. Oof. And then my car landed on its roof, wheels up, and the, it was just about end of lunchtime. So there were a few cars trailing behind me, getting back to the city from the airport area uh, to work. Baba. And everybody stopped. The whole highway stopped. And everybody thought I was dead. No, they, with their big Arabic sandals, they started breaking the glass and opening. In the meantime, I switched the ignition off. And I, my head was down. I was seat belted, fortunately, which saved my life. And I opened the door with a, a switch of the, the, the latch of the door at the bottom. And my feet were on the top. And the roof on the side, if there was a co-passenger, he would have been dead. Because at that side, the roof came down. Oh. On the co-passenger seat. But it didn't come down on my side. And I turned, and I, my head was down. I craned my neck out of the door. I said, please don't do anything. I'm alive. Just relax. I'm coming out. They cut open the belt. I crawled out with some simple glass pieces on my body. No, no major injuries, except three broken ribs. It was... Oh. Broken ribs, that's all. Nothing, nothing wrong with my lungs. I was nothing wrong with my brain. I had put the ignition off. I had the presence of my mind. I crawled out. They tried to drag me out, pull me out. I said, don't do anything. I'm all right. I'm coming out. I came out and I stood outside the car, shrugged off all the glass pieces from my suit, from my beautiful blue suit. I remember that. I uh, asked uh, to take out that camera from my back seat and please take my picture. <laughs> The photographer, in, the photographer in me had not left me. Wow. <laughs> wow. I, I think I may have done the same thing considering my affiliation with pictures and photographs. <laughs> so I got myself photographed with that BMW wheels up, head down, but me on my feet. Uh, and then, of course, I went to the hospital. And Baba. the idea only sunk into me after I got myself x rayed in the department and then. I really had a nerve shattering experience. Is it really true? And wasn't yeah. I? Dead? I asked all these questions to myself. I said, how is it that I didn't die? What was, who was that man whom I met up there? And I still have no answer. And I know that I had a lot of work to do. And a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. And thank God I am alive because this journey is so beautiful. And I'm enjoying every day of my life, meeting people, greeting people, treating people. And it gives me so much satisfaction every day to be of use to humanity. I'm wow. sure those people who are not doctors are missing this fun. Wow. 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 This is so heart steering. Oh, my God. You know, also, when you just said that uh, there's so much work to do, the man up there told you. And in 80, you said 87, 88, and then in 89, you were uh, the one who first operated on an AIDS patient as well, whereby yes. I, uh, you know, obviously at those times, uh, all and still there are misconceptions uh, regarding uh, the, you know, area of AIDS, and you uh, took the plunge. And I, I truly believe that everything is for a reason and a season. The season can be short, the season can be long, but the reason exists whether we know of it or not. And yeah. it is so it is so beautiful that God decided to send you back to all of us 
to humanity for you know all the uh, the the really outstanding things that god does through you and uh, it, it's just i'm i'm trying to uh, get words uh, to describe yes. what i'm feeling right now it was it was uh, it was a terrible disease at that time nobody even wanted to stand 20 feet away from an aids patient today i'm just covid virus reminds me of that but today you can see social distancing is still not being followed unfortunately and over there really if you say it's positive social distancing was one mile not 6 feet nobody would get even even they would not even want to breathe that air it was such a stigma and then there was a question of this young poor 17 year old prostitute who was brought to me with a terminal illness with fluid collected in the brain she had meningitis because of aids and she was uh, about to die and this uh, aids specialist said there is no body else who is willing to touch her are you are you accepting her can you do this uh, operation and save her life i said of course what am i become a doctor for haven't we taken the hippocratic oath to help everybody who is in need where is the question of not doing it i it will be my honor to do it wow. the problem was every operation every neurosurgery is a team work it's not a solo work you need a nurse you need an assistant you need an anesthetist and to get that little team working was more difficult than the operation itself but we managed it at that time it was okay i said we will take on the case and without much ado we had the gowns those days who had already given us the guidelines even at that time so we had to wear double gowns double mask double shoe uh, leggings and all those things and those goggles exactly what we are doing today for covid virus and right. we operated on the girl and it was a miraculous success this girl not only she was only 17 kilos at that time at, oh. at the age of 17 she was skin and bone and she improved her health she went back to the hospital from where she was referred they kept her as a remarkable novel case they nurtured her for 5 years because they were sure that if they let her lose she would go back to the market so she was kept over there and she blossomed into a very beautiful lady when i when i saw her year after year she was truly a beautiful girl wow, wow. at that time the aids cure was not available but still i knew that some day we will find a cure and therefore it was my duty to see that i keep her alive till the time the cure is available and then she would be cured Wow. and miracles work Baba. you must have yes. the passion the compassion then everything works then you leave it to god you leave it to nature you do your job that's what i tell my students do what True. is within your power and remain optimistic True. isn't it absolutely absolutely i'm just so dumbstruck right now and i'm just trying to you know just soak in and uh, i know with you i can uh, chat for like hours and hours and there will be no end to the clock so uh, before we move towards our last uh, part of the session i would like to ask you two more quick things one that right now as you said in this covid situation there are several people trying to fire fight uh, anxiety fear and i think more than the covid uh, things and the offshoots like depression anxiety stress of different ways and different kinds and reasons is what is getting into people and really creating uh, you know problems issues or health concerns that may even go beyond the lockdown and covid uh, please uh, share us some medical and some mindfulness and mental you know immunity tips on how can people uh, kind of uh, you know strengthen their inner uh, physical spiritual and mental immunity with a few things that we can do at home one in one short answer fear kills more than disease people are more afraid of dying sure. instead of are trying to see what, what they can do to live healthy and happy they are more afraid of dying so they are seeing death in front of them at every step what do you do with such people now the virus is in the air everything is around we know that now the government has given you guidelines and i have spoken at length on this subject for the past couple of months in fact four of my articles 
and you must read them in the last uh, month in parsi times four of my beautiful articles on on uh, on this virus and what and what is happening in the world around the world and what are how are we supposed to take it and uh, i can only say that um, that we have to understand uh, that we will today we are suffering partly of course because of the disease but more because of the fear of what the disease is going to do to us and sure. if we can observe just a few simple formula the formula is social distancing frequent hand wash and wearing a mask this in three simple words summarizes your that is the external guard but don't forget there is an internal guard the internal guard is immunity and that internal guard comes from partly your genes partly your uh, habits your the way you have been leading your life and if you have been practicing pranayam for example you know how you can follow your breath if you can follow your breath and if you can do meditation i tell i i tell all my brain tumor patients from the time that i first met marishi mahesh yogi in 1994 when i realized the value of pranayam and meditation i learned it from him at that time and later on from sri sri ravi shankar i realized the value of this and i have been practicing that uh, initially it was uh, uh, time wise we found it difficult but there is nothing like time everything can can happen if you can if you can will it you have for time for everything you have time sure. for good things and you have time for bad things but the sure. time is it has to be determined that i need time for this and i must do it so sure. if you decide that pranayam is good for you that meditation is good for you and you will do that and you will realize how much energy you will get uh, by doing this alone so that is the first thing to uh, th- apart from your physical barriers that i told about that i spoke about the other thing is developing your inner guard by this and eat healthy eat right don't eat too much you are on lockout just now so you must be careful you must diet correctly you must exercise every day physical exercise is important mental exercise is important physical important why physical exercise because it delivers more oxygen to your brain and can i share uh, sir while you talk can i share a wonderful picture i have with you doing exercising let me share this picture oh. with everyone oh. so you can go talking yes. and i will share this amazing picture yes let us see what i got so many pictures <laughs> uh, oh being a photographer myself uh, so everybody was, can see oh there you are that was in my key gym this is a beautiful gym in kolaba and i go it's very close to my hospital bombay hospital so i go there uh, every night at 10 o'clock 9:30 somewhere between 9:30 and 10 and i'm there till the gym closes at 11 and that's this uh, uh, beautiful lady who is one of the trainers and um, miss kotwal and she is uh, helping me to do these exercises but i do exercise every day and these pictures were taken by farhana contractor the mm. wife of bizibi she was uh, she was one farzana uh, she was yeah farzana, okay farzana. okay okay she brought a patient to me from panjgani and i treated her so we got a little close to each other uh, even her husband behram contractor was a good friend of mine but then i didn't know farzana at that time so but so farzana took these pictures of me and i am i am i have been doing all kinds of exercises i don't find if you have read the caption of this exercises age is no barrier Yes. So and time is no barrier. So True. don't con- don't bring in excuses for not exercising. True. You must True. understand the value of exercise. True. Oh, that's a picture of mine with my junior doctors, with my resident doctors. You see how happy they look. How cheerful. Yes. And this is yes. all one bunch of. Uh, uh, and I'm. I hope they are watching this show. And uh, and this was at one of the parties that we had uh, had in a in a in a in one of the gym khanas. after a uh, whole day's work and um, uh, you can see the brilliance on their faces how happy yes. they look and that is and that is what uh, uh, you know speaks volumes about you being an amazing mentor teacher guru to them because nurturing youngsters is such a you know is such a responsible task because uh, the the moment we uh, lose track uh, with keeping them aligned with their own vision 
we lose them completely and this picture just shows how beautifully you know you've uh, kept the bunch together and uh, it, their faces uh, just show what you mean to them in their lives yes 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 yeah. so you should you should love your students like you love your patients you yes. should love your students yeah your I, children i totally and this is one more amazing one in all full gear just yeah, about to true. save another life uh, i should have sent you a picture of my covid times gear that is not <laughs> there uh, but why we are but i have taken a picture we have been operating i have done a few cases during these last mm. few weeks also and right. uh, so if i could operate with fades with aids so i can not operate in covid times so the same right. is a cycle repeating itself yeah true and this picture is like dr turel in complete action Yes, I'm operating through a microscope. You can see my two hands, one holding a sucker to sucker with the fluid and blood, and the other is a dissecting instrument or a instrument to coagulate bleeding points. And uh, and you can see there's a binocular tube for my assistant, and a binoc and the camera is attached to the microscope. And you can see that I'm standing, and most of the times I stand and operate. But you can see I'm in complete. Uh, I'm totally lost. I'm in a meditative mood. and i'm enjoying focusing myself enjoying myself and in a very relaxed way but you can see my hands are practically free i don't even need support my only support is my two little fingers on which i rest my fingers hands and i'm operating with only the movement occurring at the tips of my fingers and it's joy sheer ecstasy beautiful, beautiful. i know about this time when you know we all uh, you know there is this whole vivid video that we all have in our own sense about the 2611 and i know that you were one of the only uh, senior consultants uh, available at bombay hospital on the night of 2611 when people were being brought and how with a bunch of resident doctors you have saved many lives including bullet injuries from the you know the commandos as well so yeah that was that was, a, that was one hell of a evening one i was as usual i was working late and uh, suddenly some patients started coming in with some bullet injuries and the first news we got was that uh, and i was the only senior consultant in the hospital and everybody had left and i was told that there was some gang war going on in kolaba so i said all right uh, whatever it is we have to see and then it was the my first patient was a so here i am on a on a cycle on a trainer cycle in the gym so i my first patient was a norwegian gentleman who had a bullet going through his face and head when it come out and he was shot in leopold cafe the first victim from leopold cafe and he ducked and escaped but the bullet still went through his three fingers and through his face and through his head and he was brought in a bleeding state with the face cut and the fingers all broken apart oh. and uh, he was on the road and there was no taxi to bring him nobody for 45 minutes was standing bleeding on the road with his girlfriend he was an elderly man uh. and but finally someone arranged for a cab and they came to the closest hospital which is bombay hospital and then uh, he was one of the first patients and i took him up to the operating room and uh, operated on him set his three fingers in place operated on his face and corrected the facial nerve and oh. then there was a chain reaction there were 70 patients with bullet injuries brought wow. in there. and i had all my resident doctors they were in the joining quarters and they were so i'm so grateful to them they all came down rushing down to rescue these people the bombay hospital kept no bars they get everybody in get all the patients no admission facility no admission formalities just get wow. them in and and i was the only deciding factor what each person required oh. if they were bleeding what to be done if they had bullets in there all of them were bullet injuries they were, if they had no bullet injuries they were not brought there and all of them were alive if they were not oh. alive they were there either in taj or beroy or leopold yeah, yeah. but those yeah. who were alive they came to the hospital and i treated 70 of them that night single handedly but not single handed with 70 pairs of hands from my resident doctors wow. and thanks to them we did not lose a single patient that night wow As a matter of fact all those who had to die died there nobody died in the hospital wow and then for three nights and days we were addressing this problem 
of course the next morning the consultants came in they couldn't come that night everybody was glued to tv but they were not allowed to the police had cordoned off that area so i was not uh, uh, so there was nothing we can do and i had to just manage that night and then uh, the second day of course we were helped by so many other people and then we divided our work if there were abdominal injuries that is not my specialty but we managed to keep them alive so whatever we could operate that night we did whatever that was that could be kept waiting were kept waiting for the next day and then came the commandos the commandos didn't come on day one as you know the commandos brought in right. later on right and three right. of them had brain injuries right. i had to operate on one commando with a head bullet injury right there in the motor area he was paralyzed and we have got a beautiful video film i'm sorry to call it beautiful it's not beautiful but anyway those bullet fragments came out and he was paralyzed the other one had a bullet going through his eyeball and the third one had a bullet going through his front Papa. So we treated them, and they all survived. All the commandos survived. So wow. we were so uh, happy and so lucky that we were of help to them. And these commandos were such handsome people. They were covered in black suit, S O O T, by the flames and by the fire. They were working in that uh, uh, house, the Jewish house. Mm. I forget the name of that house, but you know the the synagogue where they were. The, uh, where the attack. Well, not the synagogue because that. It was a house in which the Jewish family lived. Ah, the, the okay, okay, over there. Shabbat, I, 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 I forget. The in Kolaba, in Kolaba right. only. So yeah, that's yeah. where they were. They were rescuing. Plus, of course, they were rescuing in Taj also. So, what was the name of the house? I. Nariman. What is it? Nariman House. Nariman House. Nariman House. Okay. And we were, yeah. but so these handsome young men, so able of body, so strong, and uh, I must say, hats off to them that they stuck to their job. And they all survived. Wow. They all managed to, and wow. but uh, but it was a it's a great Herculean effort. This whole episode was True. not some uh, it was some nightmare. It was True. something that I don't think I may be lucky enough to see again, or unlucky enough to see again. It is a um, it is something that will shake you up. If today, if I just sit back at that moment, I was just wheeling. i was working almost automatically and i was photographing i still have those photographs of all those people on my camera and i recently also gave in one medical college a lecture on 2611 so i put the whole act together and uh, it was some uh, amazing experience i relived that experience so my life has been one kind of a but that's the world. reason but that's the reason the big man up there told you that you've got lots to do so you have to go back dr kaki thurel it's not time for you to come here Clo doors closed for you <laughs> right now no no and so no since for me i hope i don't have any of those events again coming in front of me but well no, no. if they come then god will give us the strength to do it strength it absolutely like this situation the also it has been most there. the power comes from there we are only the hands the mind the legs the eyes True. the power comes from him and if the patients are surviving it is his power and if the patients are not surviving it is our fault no. i can only say that so i think both ways it is his call what we have ordained for life and you know this entire thing of the blame game that we do to the supreme power and god all the time that why god did this or why god did that to know that we individually have our own sanskaras and our own karma and our karmic journey to go through and all of this that we have ordained we have to pass through this process with grace with humor as dr turel said and with love and forgiveness and keeping behind what uh, has to leave us so that we can pave the path ahead and move forward in our lives and also in our show right now so dr turel we end our uh, session with a universal message that is given out to the audience so from my book which you have as well angel speak i would ask you to think about uh, one number between 1 to 365 that uh, is coming to your heart that divinity is bringing to your heart right now just whichever number pops up first no lucky number or anything just whichever number and then i will read two from 279 279 okay so from the book angel speak i will read day 279 which uh, dr thurel has got 
and see what the universal message is. And if the message is resonating with you, then it means this message is for you. I don't know what you are going to read. <laughs> Beautiful. So the day 27, uh, 279, you said, right? Yes. 279, right? Yes. <clears throat> Lovely something to what Dr. Turel mentioned in early in the episode as well. This is how beautiful synchronized divinity is. Prioritize your life, organize yourself, declutter your surroundings, and then just open your heart and mind to let us angels and divinity in and work with you to release all toxins and negative energies within or around you. Be careful of your surroundings, not just in matter of things, but people too. Constantly being surrounded with people who indulge in lower energies of gossip, whining, cribbing, complaining, shall lower your energies too. Uplift them through your energies. Open the doors of divine intervention to completely organize and prioritize your life for the highest best of yourself and others. Great Isn't message. Isn't Great that message. beautiful to what you said as well, that we need to exercise, we need to do our bit and then leave the rest in the able hands of God to take over. Lovely. Thank you so much, sir, for getting this uh, wonderful number. Thank you, Roshi. You're so a we great move, host. We move, sir, towards our chanting that uh, you will do with us. And so happy that you're with us for it. Uh, Dr. Turel does a lot of meditation and a lot of soulful activities. And we are just thrilled to have him be with us through the collective chant. This chant is done for spreading the vibrations of collective force of energies into the world for healing, shielding, protection, love, wisdom, and harmony and oneness for all of humanity and creation. So I'm putting on the music. Everyone close your eyes, relax yourself and be calm. No stiffness, no this and no that. Just be comfortable and that's it. Please put your hearts and put your thumbs up or yeses in the comments so that I know you're ready for the chant. Close your eyes, loosen your neck, your shoulders, and just try to relax your body. Take your mind's eye, your focus, your intention to the heart center, in the center of your chest area. It's a beautiful place to get aligned and centered. And take a few deep breaths so that you can release all the externals of your worries and your fears outside of you. And for this moment, get into the chant. As every day, we will chant Meher Baba's name for the Nam Jap of 28 times, followed by the universal chant. And today, what we are chanting is called Om Parānandāya. Namaha, which is the divine chant of happiness. It means I am one with the divine happiness. And as this beautiful quote of Meher Baba says, real happiness lies in making others happy. And that's what the life of Dr. Turel has been as well. So with this chant, we pray that may we be in alignment and oneness with that divine happiness and do all through our thoughts, words, and deeds to make everyone else happy as well in our lives. So get ready. And we begin the Nam Jap. Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba. Meher Baba, 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 
Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba, Meher Baba. Take a deep breath. And we begin the chant. Take three deep breaths, breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. May all the energies of our collective vibration spread into the world for love, wisdom, harmony, healing, protection and shielding for all of humanity and creation, now and always. So be it, so be it, so be it. At the count of 10, very slowly open your eyes. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. You can slowly open your eyes. 
do share in the comments what was your biggest takeaway from all the magnificent things that Dr. Turel shared with us today and your experience with the message, the chant, and whatever that was discussed and spoken of through this lovely session. Please do write in the comments and write your inspiring insights of your life as well, because sharing is caring and brings in a lot of blessings in all our lives, because somewhere, sometime, it's one story, one sentence, one person, one book that can inspire and create a transformation in our lives. So do that for others as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Keki Turel, for being with us. And it was a stupendous, fantabulous session with you. And I am hungry for more. So I am going to have a longer chat with you someday when you have more time at hand to spare out of your busy schedule. And I know you are more than busy right now with uh, the COVID at hand and uh, your presence in these times of humanity is so precious that uh, I can only share my humble gratitude to God for your existence and to you as well for all that you do from all of us out here. So please share your love and blessings for a long, happy and healthy life for Dr. Turel so that he may continue God's work for a longer, 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 longer span forever and ever. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us, sir. Would you like to say any last message before we leave and shut down? Thank you very much. I think uh, this was an amazing session for me. Uh, I didn't even realize that we spent one hour talking and it just went on and on. And you were so wonderful as a host your questions, your insights, and your whole appreciation of uh, this uh, world, the deep inner world, which uh, very few people have had uh, the, the, you can say, the, uh, uh, the joy of experiencing. This is something that we must learn from you. And uh, I would certainly want to meet you again, uh, simply to be able to enrich myself with your thoughts. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you so much. I'm deeply honored and humbled to Thank hear you. that from you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, see you soon. And uh, happy and safe uh, life and evening ahead for you. Thank you so much, sir. We hope, this nation, we hope our country and our people around the planet come out of this tragedy very quickly, very soon, with minimum casualty. And uh, let's get back to normal lives. But with one lesson to learn, to respect nature at all times. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Blessings. Respect nature, bottom line, respect the laws of nature, the laws of the universe, and let us bring our lives in alignment. Everything in the universe is all about alignment and balance. Anything that, it of, uh, that is of this ease is what is out of alignment and out of balance. So with all these incredible things that uh, Dr. Torel shared with us, I am a little gulping with emotions as well right now. And uh, you can pick that up. But uh, I, would, I would really love you to take in all this, you know, this, uh, this plethora of insights through each of these sessions. And please share the videos and the links with one and all so that we can have more and more people to be inspired and empowered because one soul empowered is a society empowered. And let's do our bit to spread this joy, happiness and inspiration to people so that we can spread more and more goodness. And I ask you again to join my light brigade of spreading this love, joy, happiness, and wisdom across the world by sharing all our links 
with all your friends across social media and bringing in lots more friends every day. So this week is going to be our last week now for the 21 day series of well-being wisdom shared with these amazing souls. Meet me tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. with an incredible mother-daughter Jodi of Mansi Joshi Roy and her enterprising young kid, Kiara Bose Roy, tomorrow at our Serene Sundays. So see you all. A very, very big namaste and Jai Baba to all of you. Big, big, big hugs. Stay safe, loved and protected in love and light and super duper duper duper. Godspeed. Love you all. Stay blessed, please, and strong. No fear, but precautions. Thank you so much. Love you. And yes, thank you for being a fantastic audience who comes in every single day diligently. We are almost on our 54th live session from 18th of March. So big, 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 big round of applause for all of you who have gone through all the 50 episodes with me. And I love you all. And I give my heartfelt gratitude to you for being a part of this journey and being at the other side of this fence, receiving and helping me in spreading more and more love and joy and giving this blessed opportunity to my soul. Thank you so much once again. I have a lot of postscripts always after the first namaste. Namaste once again and Jai Baba. Love you.